Hi, this is Saqib Rahman from the OrthoClips podcast series. And today uh, we're going to be talking with Dr. Javad Parvizi, who is the James Edwards Professor of Orthopedic Surgery at the Sydney Kimmel Medical College and the Rothman Institute at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital. And today we're going to be talking about periprosthetic joint infection, misconceptions, and management tips. Thank you, for, uh, Dr. Parvizi, for coming on the show. Thank you. Okay. So let's get right into it. Uh, I guess first I just wanted to ask, how did you get uh, interested in this field? Um, what uh, draw you into it? What um, kind of got you interested uh, in this particular problem? Because it really is a problem. Sure. Back in my residency at Mayo Clinic in the first year of my residency there, there was a patient who had undergone uh, numerous operations, a 54-year-old gentleman who unfortunately died during his uh, uh, reimplantation operation. And at the time, I realized there was not much attention being paid to the issue of infection. Infection was considered to be a very, very rare complication. But each time I came in, into contact with the patients, I realized the the new, huge um, psychological, economic, and uh, health-related burden that they had, they had endured in their lives. And um, I just couldn't understand why we were not paying enough attention to the issue. And the issue was definitely there, uh, but not getting much of attention. And at the time, there were other issues in total joint replacement to solve, you know, the issue of wear, osteolysis, dislocation, et cetera. Although some of those still remain, for the most part, the, the bigger issues have been sorted out and the lower apples have been picked and infection has sort of emerged as the most urgent and most uh, compelling problem after joint replacement. But interestingly, I'm sure you'll agree uh, that this has continued to sort of uh, spill into other fields in uh, orthopedics, other subspecialties, and even in other fields of surgery, infection has now become one of the most important, if not the most important issue to deal with. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the, um, uh, you know, the, the problems we've seen, especially with MRSA infections, just soft tissue infections alone, um, even when we don't have implants involved, has uh, become a big problem in adults, even in kids. Um, I guess you talked about initially in your residency, it was felt that um, these were very rare things. I guess maybe you were hinting at that being a misconception perhaps. And that was my second question that what would you like to point out as some of the misconceptions or myths about pre-prosthetic joint infection that you want to make sure you get out there and clarify. Yeah, so absolutely. I agree with that comment you just made. The misconception being that this is a rare problem. I'm not quite sure if that's really true. The more you look for it, the more of it you will see. And now that we've got better diagnostic modalities and better protocols for evaluation, thanks to the American Academy and Musculoskeletal Infection Society and others, we are looking more and more into this problem and see more. So that's the first misconception. The second misconception that I hear a lot on the podium is people saying infection is a good problem to have because it has 100% cure. That's not true at all. Infection has a very, very bad outcome. If you develop infection after joint replacement, your success at best is around the 70 to 80%. But that's after having to endure multiple surgical procedures, being on antibiotics that may leave you with systemic complications, numerous readmissions to the hospital. And, you know, Guo Li from University of Pennsylvania published a beautiful paper showing that even the winners are losers. Um, the patients who had their infection under control, or so called cured, their functional outcome was terrible, but they were not complaining because they were worried about surgeons taking them back to the OR again and operating on them. So that's a second misconception that the outcome of two stage exchange or one stage exchange is great. It isn't, those issues exist. The third is the uh, impact 
that this has on the society overall and on the patient in terms of, again, psychological and economic impact. Many patients are never able to return back to their jobs that they used to enjoy. Many of them have uh, been disabled for a long period of time with the spaces in place. It takes a toll on their life, on their psychological status, and some of these patients lose their marriages. They, they slide into uh, economic abyss as a result of developing this complication. And the other that you hear, which is a misconception, is that, oh, we are able to diagnose infection very easily. That is still is not true because even despite having biomarkers, having molecular techniques such as next generation sequencing, having uh, more sophisticated modes of diagnosis and having algorithms in place, I think we are still missing quite a few of these patients. And surgeons operating on the so-called aseptic cases may actually not be true. These patients may have an infection that have either escaped detection because of the insensitivity of the um, modalities we have in place, or they haven't even been looked at as an infected case and evaluated. And the misconceptions go on, but I know we have limited time, but there really is a lot of misconceptions. And I really urge our young residents uh, to pay attention to this issue and try to really uh, put energy and effort in trying to address some of these issues and try to get rid of these misconceptions and bring evidence into our field. I think um, the last example you gave is uh, certainly something that holds true um, in what I do in orthopedic trauma. When you think about uh, non-unions, you know, you don't always find infection. It's sometimes hard to find infection and you keep it in the back of your mind that maybe it's infected and you still don't find anything. And I bet a lot of those are, are infected, but you just aren't able to really prove it. Um, at least with the methods that we've been using. Yeah. Um, and you talked about evidence. Um, so what are some of the uh, important findings in the maybe last five years or so in the literature that uh, have really changed management. Um, you talked about a lot of early diagnostic methods. Uh, you mentioned the academy. Um, I know you were part of uh, putting together some of the guidelines. What have we learned in the last five years? Yeah, great question. A lot has actually happened over the last five years. First of all, these guidelines from academy, from the Moscow Skeletal Infection Society, and then as you know, we also had this international consensus meeting in Philadelphia in two, two different time points, 2013 and 2018. The compendium that was put together that does include infection is all available on the website. It's just icmphilly.com. Uh, there are mod modalities for diagnosis. So those are protocol based and, and ICM Philly is also an app that also has the diagnosis uh, algorithm LinkedIn. Uh, you should definitely try that out. PGIDX is the name of that uh, app that's inside the ICM Philly app. But going back into the development, so first is that we've now realized that we may never have a single test for diagnosis of infection, especially in the field of orthopedics where infection is associated with, a, with an implant. So instead of looking for that single absolute test, we need to come up with better criteria. And there are better criteria defined. First was that MSIS criteria that we put together in 2011. That has been modified multiple times. And now I think the new diagnostic criteria that actually assigns a score to each test and comes up with a cumulative score that tells you whether the patient is or is not infected is a better way of looking at this. And medicine is full of these examples. Like look at SLE. How do you diagnose ankylosing spondylitis? Even diagnosis of depression or many of these conditions is not based on a single test. It's just difficult. So I don't think we'll ever have a single test. I hope I'm wrong and we will, but I doubt we will have a single test for diagnosis of infection. So in the absence of an absolute test, we need to rely on a combination of these tests that may take into account the clinical situation of the patient. And that's definitely true for infected non-union. I hope you will agree. The second is that we should be looking for proxy when we can't isolate the organism, uh, because they are, uh, they are in a sessile form, they are on the implant surface as a biofilm, and based on Eddie Schwartz's work, they sometimes even in the 
canaliculi of the bone where you will not be able to access them. So why not look for a proxy as opposed to finding the organism? Proxy is the biomarkers. And I think there's been huge advances made in the field of biomarkers in medicine altogether and orthopedic infections being one of them. Uh, so the biomarkers are proving more and more valuable. You know, we talked about Luke Estres many years ago, then there was alpha defensin, and now there's talk of calprotectin and numerous other biomarkers are coming out. Great, that's wonderful. We also need to develop a biomarker in serum because getting biomarker from synovial fluid or from an infected non-union site or spine, for example, is difficult. Either there's inadequate fluid or whatever fluid we have in there is not really going to be helping us in isolating it. So serum markers are going to be very promising. We have worked on a few and I think other investigators are working on a few others. We will see a serum marker that will be hopefully more specific towards orthopedic infections. Whether that's going to be D-dimer, fibrinogen, IL-6, or whatever else, we will see. That will come. The third area is the molecular diagnostics that you just alluded to also. So to isolate the organism from implant-related infections, and whether that's orthopedics, neurosurgery, urology, it goes on, or cardiology like endocarditis, et cetera, is difficult because these organisms are not floating around in planktonic form for us to isolate them put them on culture and then, I, and then diagnose the infection. And culture is a very old technology, you know, 1860, it was okay in those days. It, is, it relies on so many stars lining up for us to be able to isolate the organism. And that it's taking the sample from the right place, transferring it on the, in the right medium, getting it to the lab, processing it, putting it into the right condition, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on. So culture is going to be replaced by molecular techniques. And that is, I am 100% sure about that. It's just a matter of time when that will happen. So because of the, the reduction in the cost of sequencing in the recent years, we've seen uh, next generation sequencing metagenomics are lending themselves beautifully in this field for us to isolate the DNA of organisms from the site of infection as opposed to being able to culture viable organisms. And three things have come out of our research and others that are working in this field. One is that yes, you can isolate the DNA in 90% of those so-called culture negative cases. Two is that majority of these infections are polymicrobial. I know that doesn't come as a surprise to you as a trauma surgeon, because I'm sure you've seen that a lot, but even in joint surgery, that's actually happens to be the case. And connected to that polymicrobial existence, what happens is that we, by culture, we always isolate the most dominant organism, but we miss the others that are there to take over. And under antibiotic pressure and treatment, we will push a patient that had staph aureus infection to developing a fungal infection or infection with pseudomonas. And the fungus and the pseudomonas were actually there in the first place. They just weren't pathogen. And now given the right circumstances, they turn out to be a pathogen. So the molecular techniques is very different. And most importantly, Sakiba, I'm very, very uh, encouraged about m uh, better methodologies for prevention of infection. And in this uh, day and age where you and I are both sitting at home because of COVID-19, that's going to be so critical in medicine moving into future. Better antiseptic solutions, better uh, air filtration systems, uh, and, and the list goes on. And that in itself is a different podcast that we'll do maybe in the future. But better preventative measures that are going to be in place to try to reduce the transmission of pathogen from environment to host or from host to host. I think that's the area where we're going to see a lot of development. And this unfortunate circumstances today is going to lend itself to great innovations that we will see emerge in the next year or two. A lot of interesting stuff um, for our listeners to uh, digest there. Uh, and I think, you're, uh, I think you're right in terms of where we're heading. I sure hope we are because things like cultures uh, certainly seem like uh, pretty antiquated um, and uh, don't always seem to give us the answers. Sometimes you see an infection and it still doesn't culture anything. <laughs> 
Yeah. I'm culturing pus that I'm not getting anything. Yes, exactly. So um, let's just wrap up maybe uh, by having you give me a practical example. Um, let's say, you know, you unfortunately have uh, done a total hip on one of your patients and uh, something doesn't seem right and uh, they're not doing as well. It's not an obvious infection. So they're not, they're not draining out of their wound, yeah. but they're six months down or or maybe you can just tell me what, what are your, what are your thought process in terms of like timing since the surgery and what are the factors that guide your, um, your, uh, method of assessment to make yeah. sure, you know, you're not worried about an infection. Sure. Absolutely. I'll give you a great example of a patient. He's a retired endocrinologist. He's 81 years of age, had a total knee done, uh, two and a half years ago by a very competent, good surgeon in Philadelphia region. Patient continued to have, uh, has a knee replacement, continued to have pain in the post-operative period. His knee was swelling up. The surgeon, I mean, we see painful knees. It's not rare. We see painful knees and they, some of them are swollen. The surgeon basically treats him with anti-inflammatories, has his spine evaluated, has his hip evaluated, the usual process. It was probably about eight months before the surgeon decided to aspirate the knee. And this is a surgeon in an academic setting who has great contributes to the literature. After eight months, culture of the synovial fluid came back as negative and the parameters were uh, mildly elevated. Um, it would have met the criteria, the new criteria, uh, the ICM, uh, ICM criteria for infection, but nonetheless, patient continued to be watched. He continued to complain, went to see another surgeon, and then another surgeon, then another surgeon. Eventually, lands on my doorsteps. I look at it, his knee's swollen, feels warm. He's two and a half years out. Absolutely. The first thing that should come to the mind of a resident dealing with a patient that has painful joint replacement should be infection infection unless proven otherwise. And the best way to do this, based on academy guidelines, first you order ESR and CRP, and then you aspirate the joint. But you have to remember ESR and CRP can't be normal in some of these so-called slow-growing organisms. And that includes C. acne, now coagulative staph, etc. I aspirated the joint. The serology was slightly elevated, sent it for next generation sequencing, microgen DX, sends me a report back saying that he has an infection by Cochuria. Never heard of that organism. K-O-C-U-R-I-A. Called the lab, they said, yeah, absolutely. 99% of the DNA in that fluid is Cochuria. So we talked to the patient, he's a physician, he's in pain, he decides to go through. I did a one stage exchange on this gentleman. Definitely pus, to your point, there was inflammatory tissues, there was, uh, perilum material, removed all his components, including patella, did the one stage exchange, put the new implants in. I send the sample to next generation sequencing fluid as well as sample sweat and next generation sequencing Cochiri again. Lab calls me back saying he has a staph epi infection. I said, well, are you aware of the NGS data? They said, yeah, but it's definitely staph epi. I said, okay. Our ID uh, physician starts to treat the patient. Three days later, I get a lab uh, email from the director of the lab telling me that, no, it was not a staph epi. It was Cochiri after all. And then we go through and change the antibiotics. And this gentleman is all, uh, about three months out. He's doing fine. I spoke to him a couple of days ago. So three lessons I learned from this particular case. One, and I want to stress it again, and I'm sorry to repeat myself, any painful joint is infection unless proven otherwise. And just because ESR and CRP came back as normal, that should not give you a false reassurance that this patient is not infected. Keep that in the back of your mind. Number two, uh, there is an expanding menu of organisms that cause infection. Just because we haven't seen them in the past shouldn't give you the false reassurance that this is false negative, this is contamination, Etc. For a long time, and I'm sure now in your field of trauma, the same, we used to consider a staph epi as a contaminant. We would say, oh, no, that's not an organism. If it's not a staph aureus, it's not infection. Absolutely not true anymore. All organisms can be a pathogen, and they are a pathogen in this circumstance. And three, listen to your patients. 
If they're unhappy, there is a reason for them to be unhappy. Look for a cause, hold their hand. Just because you're a great surgeon doesn't mean your patients cannot have infection or they cannot have complications or they cannot have the problems. So listen to those. And infection is one of those challenging areas. And we are, of course, as surgeons, very optimistic. We feel that we've done a great job. And if our patient is unhappy, they must have psychological issues, et cetera. No, not always. That's not the case. So those are some lessons I continue to learn. I've been in practice 22 years. Every day I go to work, I'm learning new lessons. And this particular one really uh, taught me a few lessons, which I hope that your listeners will also uh, benefit from. Yeah, I think especially the last point you made about listening to your patients and not being, um, not having that bias as the treating surgeon that, um, you know, that it's okay, that it's, you know, you, you don't want it to be a problem. Um, and sometimes a, an objective set of eyes can kind of step in and not have the same bias. And to the residents listening, sometimes that may be you. If you're in an academic center and you see this patient walk into your, uh, into your attending's office, that, um, and, you know, it may be their patient and they really haven't strongly considered or come to, come to grips that maybe that's what's going on. And you may have to be the one to, to kind of um, be objective uh, and uh, take the complaint seriously. So I agree. great stuff. Um, I think with that, we'll bring it to a close. Um, again, we've been talking about periprosthetic uh, joint infection, misconceptions, and management tips with uh, Dr. Uh, Javad Parvizi um, from uh, Jefferson and the Rothman Institute in Philadelphia. Uh, it was great talking to you. I really appreciate you taking the time. My pleasure. Thank you, Sagib. Have a great day and uh, good being on the podcast with you. Thank you so much. All the best.